um, my pleasure now to introduce you to Doug Fisher. Um, he's actually a professor on um, machine learning MOOC. Um, he used machine learning MOOC with his students on campus. Um, and he, wrapped, he wrote a paper about wrapping the MOOC around that course um, with Coursera. Um, and he's very kindly agreed to talk about that with us today. So thank you very much, Doug, and I hope um, to hear from you soon. Here we go. So I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, much of my personal experience um, wrapping a MOOC uh, in my on-campus courses. I'm not sure how I can control the slide deck there. Who would I be interacting with to do that? Oh, I can get Martin to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I can just forward it. So if you can forward from the title slide to... Um, are you seeing the slides up there? Not yet. Let me see. So, is Martin happen to be there? Uh, yeah, there you go. Are you just sharing your slides? Let me see. Hmm. Actually. <clears throat> Doug, can you share your screen with us and just show us your? Um, yes, I probably can. Let's. Um... You hover, hover over to the left, or the towards the top. It's the green icon. Uh, a green icon. Yeah. Let's see. Let's okay. So you should be seeing something now. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes, lovely. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Martin. So can you see now see the title slide? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. I'm going to try and put it in a slideshow. Yeah. Everything good? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> I think I'm going to skip past the big picture here. I'm pretty sure you all know the big picture, and uh, since we are uh, running behind. I'll simply go to the um, uh, my experience and then we'll return to the big picture later. You're probably at this point looking at a uh, slide announcing the Stanford uh, online courses. Uh, there's a robot in front from the machine learning course. Uh, could you just maybe, um, instead of doing a slide share, can you just do it from your deck? We can't see you. Sure. Yeah. Yep. Brilliant. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so this is the uh, this is the announcement of the uh, Stanford online courses back in um, uh, oh this is uh, November uh, 2011, and there were three courses being offered online. Uh, one was in machine learning, one was in database, and one was in artificial intelligence, and. I was teaching two of those three courses the following semester in fall 2000 uh, or spring 2012 at Vanderbilt. And for various reasons, I had been, I think I was prepared to use other professors' content in my courses, given some earlier experience at the National Science Foundation. Um, but I decided if, if this material, if these lecture materials were available when I did my courses in uh, spring 2012, I would uh, use them, and in fact, uh, the material was available in spring 2012 when I taught my um, undergraduate database course and my graduate machine learning course. So you all are pretty, I'm sure, familiar with the idea of flipping the class. So here is a week two um, uh, uh, schedule for uh, an example of, of what I would do. I would have students watch the videos from uh, Jennifer Whiteham. This is in database. She was the Stanford uh, faculty member teaching the MOOC. This is after the MOOC was done. and This was actually the first time I did this. This was before Coursera was founded. And so there were no terms of service to worry about. The videos were just up and online. 
uh, I had students watch those. I adopted um, Jennifer Whiteham's uh, textbook and database to make for a, a, a smoother um, uh, experience for the students because they were both reading and uh, and watching her videos. You can see in the middle that um, I would also quiz students on uh, the material. So they would watch the videos the week before. They would walk into class. It was a Tuesday, Thursday class. They would take a quiz on the videos and the reading that they were supposed to do. And then we would do some kind of in-class exercise. And for this example, so, well, here's an example of uh, Jennifer Whiteham's, uh, a screenshot of Jennifer Whiteham's video in a database. Um, this is a good nuts and bolts lecture. Uh, I think I will always want to do the inspirational lectures uh, in person, but for nuts and bolts, I'm, I'm a big believer in, uh, in video. So you can see Jennifer Whiteham there in the, in the bottom um, right. She's interacting with the screen, uh, displaying PowerPoint. Students would watch these kinds of uh, videos, for the most part, of the nuts and bolts variety. And then they would walk into class following a quiz, and they would um, do some other exercise. And in this case, this other exercise um, was to watch a video by Hans Rosling on um, um, visualizing data. Um, and you should be seeing Hans here. Uh, the year is 1948, and he's talking about a visualization of um, uh, economics and health in 200 uh, countries over 200 years. Um, just do a sanity check. Are we all there? Yeah. yeah. Great. So they would watch a video like this, a very short video in class, and then they would spend the class reverse engineering a database that would be sufficient to support um, Hans Rosling's uh, visualization here. Um, and it was a much more interactive uh, experience than just listening to uh, me lecture, giving the same kinds of nuts and bolts that Jennifer Whiteham had already done. Um, now, you might imagine if you're a student and you're watching Hans Rosling lecture and then you're engaged with your colleagues and with the professor, one on, you know, in small groups working on a, a problem, engaged in active learning, that um, things might improve. And things did improve. Um, this was, you know, when I first started doing this, I was, uh, I was worried, quite frankly, what uh, other people would think of my using other professors' lectures. Um, I was worried about what Vanderbilt would think. I was worried about what my students would think, what my colleagues would think. But um, it's been a great success, and um, everyone seems to have liked what I did, which is one reason I'm director of the Vanderbilt Institute for Digital Learning right now. But um, <laughs> these are, these are uh, class ratings, and um, you'll notice that um, I guess the surprise for me was having my students watch other professors' lectures, um, my instructor rating has increased uh, across uh, virtually all classes. In my field of special interest, artificial intelligence, it's, it's held steady. So these are ratings that are taken at the end of the semester, and they're on five-point scales, and um, on a five-point scale. And I've done this now in three classes. Um, I've highlighted in green, the green box, um, the database um, uh, progression. At the bottom there of that green box, you can see my in my pre-MOOC use of materials, my ratings were you know, three is average, four is very good, five is excellent. Um, you know, they were, they were decent ratings, um, but they were nothing to write home about. But those ratings have increased. Those, the means have increased uh, as I've adopted um, MOOC use and as I have adjusted to it. Um, so that now at the top in spring 2013, this, you know, a semester ago, things are quite good. I think if you look at the bottom observation, just that summary observation in the red box, um, again, the experience was that the instructor rating was typically going up, uh, or at least holding steady. Uh, and as importantly, I think, the standard deviations are going down. Um, now, there are some confounds to all this. Um, I was really excited about the course. I don't think, quite frankly, that the fact that the students were watching another professor's lectures 
even though they were very good, um, was primarily responsible for this increase. Um, although I think it was responsible for some of it, because they could go back, they could watch the lectures over and over again. Um, they were very good uh, lectures. Um, but I think in large part this is due to the fact that they're engaged in active learning inside the classroom. The confounds here are probably several. Um, I was a lot more excited to go in and, and work with a class in smaller groups uh, than I was to uh, lecture from PowerPoint. Quite frankly, lecturing from PowerPoint has become very old. So that's an example of a confound. I was just a lot more enthusiastic about uh, some of these classes um, than I had been before. Um, but you know, as a good academic, I think if you're going to be using other people's content, um, you start producing your own. Um, and I started producing my own uh, for my AI courses first, then for my um, uh, database courses. And I would simply do voice over PowerPoint. Um, what I noticed after putting up, producing some of this content and uh, putting it up online, because I had been impressed by the, the very good nuts and bolts lectures of um, some of my colleagues. And if you don't know what a nuts and bolts lecture is, it's, um, you know, it's describing an algorithm or a mathematical proof in some detail. It's not a kind of inspirational lecture or a big picture lecture. It's sort of getting into the um, trench and, and, and working on something uh, technical. Um, and again, I think these are much better online. And I started doing my own nuts and bolts lecture. And I was happy to find that I could do outstanding nuts and bolts lectures, too, so long as I was willing to put the time into them. But um, what happened after I did this is other students started finding my lectures online and started using it. Um, and um, this was, uh, you know, this was quite a revelation. When this first started happening, you can see the student comments here. They were coming to my YouTube channel to look at my AI videos. These were students in a UC Berkeley MOOC on artificial intelligence. So MOOC students coming to my YouTube um, station to, uh, to uh, you know, remediate their understanding of uh, some of the content that had been described in that, um, uh, in that uh, uh, MOOC. Um, so this was, this was good. I went back to the discussion board and, and verified this. But, um, you know, this is, this is sort of an example, updated statistics on my, um, on my YouTube channel. And at the top uh, left there, you can see, you, know, you can get a glimpse of the pattern of performance over the number of views. Um, you know, 37,000 views is small by MOOC numbers, but uh, it's a lot more views than I've ever gotten before. And, you know, if you look elsewhere, if you look on the uh, far left, or far right rather, see the subscribers 121. This is the first time I've ever had followers of any kind in my life. So this is kind of a kick as well. But, you know, I think, and this is going to be something that I, uh, I come back to, is you look at a pattern like this, and it impressed upon me the fact that um, much of our educational data mining work, so far as MOOCs are concerned, is looking at uh, patterns of student behavior within the MOOC itself. Um, but really, I think where we will go, I hope where we will go, is understanding that a MOOC is, I, I, I liken it to a, um, a, uh, the sun and the solar system. And there's a much larger ad hoc community that grows up around a MOOC. And really what we want to be looking at eventually is that larger community and mining the data from that larger community. So my hypothesis about my YouTube um, channel performance is that, um, is that uh, these uh, high points are synced with uh, MOOC use. And to some extent, I verified that. Now, something that I've done um, since this experience of students using my MOOC is uh, edX has just opened the way for um, um, closed, what they call closed instances of courses. And I'm now using that um, 188 MOOC, the material from that 188 MOOC from UC Berkeley, as part of my current artificial intelligence course. And I don't show you a, um, a screenshot here, but um, I can go in and I can, they seed this closed instance with um, the UC Berkeley 
lecture material and quiz material and, and test material. And I can go in, and, and I have gone in and swapped out some of their material and substituted some of mine. I've augmented the material, the lecture material from UC Berkeley with some of my own. I've augmented it with lectures from University of British Columbia. Uh, so I've gone in, I've customized my course um, using UC Berkeley content, Vanderbilt content, University of British Columbia content, and probably down the road other content as well. This is something I'll highlight in a second that, um, you know, something that I think is really exciting to me is that um, this MOOC activity is, has made me feel for the first time as a teacher that I am a member of a community. I mean, as a scholar, I've been a member of a research community for a very long time, but um, I have never felt like I was a member of a community um, as a teacher. When I walked into the class, it was my class, and quite frankly, as you get older, the idea that you are now a member of a teaching community is a lot more exciting than the whole lone wolf idea that you walk into your class and it's your class. That's just an old concept for me now, something that uh, I think I I don't enjoy nearly as much as being a part of a larger scholarly like community of teachers. Just to show you that we can do other kinds of content, it's not all video. Uh, this is a um, uh, this is a wiki book that I started that's uh, community driven. Uh, the intent here is to use um, um, well we're running short on time so I won't explain it but <clears throat> uh, community driven content uh, in the form of wiki books open source materials, the AI course uh, uses a uh, text which is freely available online as well that I can adopt and, and use in my uh, lectures because of the uh, licensing. The next time that I teach a um, machine learning course online, I really expect that I'm going to be customizing it even to a greater extent than I did before. And these are the two main themes I want to stress right now is, is one of community, which I've already talked about, but also customization. Uh, I, I overheard the last speaker talking about um, University of Edinburgh's AI planning course. But if I ever teach a machine learning course again, <clears throat> I think I will customize it by drawing on, if I can, uh, material from different sources not just the machine learning course from Stanford on the Coursera platform that I had used before, but uh, another machine learning MOOC that uh, may be offered from uh, Washington. Um, and some of the learning content that's in the uh, AI planning courses, natural language courses, as well as some of my own content. So I'm now getting pretty comfortable with the idea that um, uh, I can customize courses, I can draw from different sources given my edX experience, and students aren't freaked out about this. They like it. Um, they like looking at different professors for different content. That's not something I had uh, thought that they, they might like, but uh, they seem to. So educational data mining, just some questions uh, suggested by this experience. Um, I think we want to look beyond individual MOOCs and, and, and mine data from what I call the MOOC solar system. How do MOOC students interact with YouTube, Wikipedia, other sources? There's going to be a challenge there. How do we get that data? Who's going to give us the data? Is Google going to hand us the, the data for this kind of thing? How do we link users in a Coursera course or an edX course or Udacity course with um, users in, um, uh, in some of these other open, um, open source uh, environments? <clears throat> so some real challenges there about uh, how do you get that data? How do you link it up? Uh, and of course, how do you mine it? Um, I think, you know, one thing that I've been tempted to do is, is start creating content intentionally. So not just putting, when I put up material, when I produce material now, um, I tend to be, I'm, I'm busy right now, but uh, when I do, I intend to be pretty strategic about it. And I'm going to put up content that fills gaps in MOOCs. I, as an expert in a MOOC, know where students are going to have a problem with content in a MOOC and I can fill that content in. I can bridge that those points of um, difficulty in advance um, with content of my own. Um, and I think we'll see other examples of that. I want to do, have my graduate students do this. I've had graduate students in my advanced courses produce and upload educational content as a requirement of the graduate course 
and I think I will do that more, and I will have them look to MOOCs to figure out exactly what content um, will be most, um, uh, most useful given the current resources on the web. Um, if we go below to uh, benefits of the on MOOCs, um, you know, the, I think there are some real, so flipping the classroom is an obvious one. Um, I think there's real course design issues. The previous speaker mentioned that online learning and education have been around for a long time, and that's true. Um, but how do you take as an on-campus instructor, I think this is a new question, and incorporate a MOOC in whole or in part into an existing on-campus course in a way that's ideal, in some optimal way, in a way that maintains the faculty engagement, which is the second bullet there and which is a, not a no-brainer at all. I mean, we can imagine faculty members incorporating MOOCs and then sort of becoming very disengaged, unengaged with their courses. These are things we're going to want to better understand. Um, and then within these local learning communities, in addition just to learning the material, um, how do students interact as a local learning community uh, in their own class with the global learning community that's part of the MOOC, if in fact the MOOC and the on-campus course are synced? I'm going to ask Fiona or um, uh, for a time check. How am I looking? Um, it's okay. We can spare you a few more minutes. How much longer do you have to go? We want to ask you some questions. I can go a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I will hit a couple a couple more points for you, know, and then I will I will close. Brilliant. Okay. Um, so this is you know even in October 2012 you could complete essentially a computer science degree online and for free, given the MOOCs that were up from different uh, places. <clears throat> and I think that you will, with all this plethora of resources, not just MOOCs, but um, resources on YouTube, Khan Academy, uh, elsewhere, uh, you can, well, we know students are already customizing curricula, if you will. They're looking at different ways of working their way through a sequence of courses. So they might take the intro course from uh, edX in programming. They might take a, a second uh, course in data structures from Udacity and then move on to some Coursera courses from different universities. Um, and so they create their own sequence and we can certainly do this. Um, but once, start, once students start creating their own sequences um, and start embedding these within larger social networks, uh, we now open the possibility of crowdsourcing and that some of these trajectories through existing online um, courses and other remedial material are endorsed or not endorsed by the community and then become consensus favorites. Um, and so, <clears throat> you know, I think crowdsourcing curricula is going to be something that's going to emerge in the near future. Um, Vanderbilt and the University of Maryland have just joined forces to offer not the first MOOC sequence, not the first MOOC, but the first MOOC sequence. So this, these are back-to-back -back MOOCs with a kind of loose, intended to have a loose coupling, and so that students will get something added by doing the sequence um, above and beyond simply taking two independent MOOCs. Um, again, I think you'll see university partnerships that um, that create these um, curricular constructs. Uh, that then are vetted by the community. Um, I'm going to go to the very, this is not the very end, but this is my last slide, <coughs> design strategies for MOOCs. Um, we want to start designing MOOCs with local learning communities in mind. Not just, so much of the MOOC landscape now is opportunistic. Um, we get, uh, we use MOOCs for lo local learning communities, but how can we design? What are the design criteria when we actually start deliberately designing MOOCs with local learning communities as well as global learning communities in mind. Um, design MOOCs for remixing. Um, again, I think customization is going to be a, a big thing and if you can create your MOOCs so that I can swap in um, certain things and take out other things, I think it will be, um, it will be a benefit. And finally, design MOOCs with research opportunities in mind. So we can use MOOCs for research questions. Right now, much of the data mining is, again, opportunistic. Let's look at the data and see what happens. But let's say that midway through a class, I ask half the students the following question. If you finish with distinction, 
would you be willing to become a community TA for the next offering of this class? I ask that question of half the students. I don't ask it of the other half. And I look to see how such a question, as uh, simple as it may seem, affects retention rates, affects completion rates, affects the rates at which students obtain distinction. Another example that we might ask is um, we're interested in looking at the MOOCs and other kinds of social media. Um, we want to have students tweet some online lectures and then take quizzes. Half the students tweet, half the students don't in real time, and we look to see how this improves or doesn't um, uh, <coughs> comprehension in quizzes and whatnot. And so moving from opportunistic research to deliberative planned hypothesis testing is something that um, I think um, certainly at Vanderbilt you'll see more of, and um, but I can't help but to think uh, you'll see it everywhere. Um, if it's not happening already. And that's. I guess I'll just stop right there, Fiona, because uh, as I said, I could go on a long time. It's lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, it, it's really weird talking to a screen, so it's really odd that I can't see you. But um, I'm just going to ask if there are any questions for you. If, does anyone have any questions for Doug? Oh, yeah, we do. I'll just get the microphone so you can hear Doug. <laughs> <laughs> so who you are. Hi Doug, this is Helen Gillespie, I'm from UEA in Norwich and um, I was just wondering if we could um, transport you back a few years to your beginnings of dabbling to the mix. Um, can you hear me, Jamie? Fiona, can you repeat that? Yeah, we're, come, hang on, we're, gonna, come we're just going to come up to the front and then... Okay. Hi, hi Doug, this is Helena Gillespie from, uh, from UEA. Um, and I just wanted to ask you if we could transport you back in time um, a, a few years to the beginnings of your dabblings in, in the world of MOOCs. Is there anything that you would do differently? Because um, that's kind of where we're at at the moment. And I think we'd kind of like to learn from your experience. And if, if there are some traps out there, we'd quite like not to fall into them. Uh, so uh, is there anything that you would, you would change or do differently? Or, or is the fact, I really like the way you just, just sort of describe it as sort of serendipitous. Is the serendipitous thing just part of what we should embrace? Thanks. Um, well, I think th I, I think to some extent the serendipitous is something we should embrace. We should try certainly new things. Um, I am sort of naturally conservative in doing these kinds of things, um, and I think that that conservatism um, was an advantage. Um, one thing I was told by the higher level administration here is. You are in your current position as director because you did some interesting things and you did them by the rules. Um, um, so, for example, if you have if you have MOOCs in your courses, this would be a, this is something to think about. If you uh, use MOOC materials in your classes, um, at least it was the case that some of the terms of service for some of these um, groups, Coursera, for example. Um, said that you needed explicit written permission if you were going to use this material as part of a tuition um, uh, bearing course. Um, now the problem is if an instructor requires that students turn in assignments from a MOOC as part of their on-campus course, the instructor is not in violation of those terms of service. The students are in violation of those terms of service for turning it in. Um, and you don't want to, as an instructor, put your students in violation of terms of service. So um, those kinds of sort of legalistic traps are things to think about as you move forward. Um, uh, student, you know, you might start off slowly. I, I sort of naturally started off slowly. I did not rely on any of the material other than the lectures. I quizzed the students myself, uh, had them do the uh, different assignments than the uh, MOOC assignments. So they were watching lectures, but I was still remaining very engaged in the, in the course. Um, again, I think a possible trap, and it's to some extent something I have felt um, uh, this year um, for the first time, but I think it's probably just due to my new job rather than um, the way I've structured the course per se, is I think we want to be aware of um, getting two um, faculty becoming disengaged from their students because they are relying heavily or they start relying too heavily on, on the MOOC material. Um, there is also, I think, you want to think about how is the online material going to uh, um, relate to the on for the in-class experience. 
creating in-class activity takes time. And if you don't take the time to create that in in class activity, I think you will you will fall down as an instructor. The students won't like it. So there has to be some relationship between them. Okay, thank you. So are there we've got time for one more short question? No, there's no more questions, Doug. Thank you so much. That was excellent. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.